It's time for a new seasonal strain from our friends and sponsors at Imperial Organic Yeast. W04 Paramount is a specialized wine strain perfect for salsa fermentations. Imperial W04 Paramount is available now through the end of February. You know we love Imperial Yeast. My stir plate is dusty because I don't make starters anymore for moderate gravity 5 gallon batches. With a pitch rate of 200 billion cells per easy to open packet, my airlocks are usually bubbling before bedtime. Ask your local homebrew store for Imperial Organic Yeast and check them out at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, January 21st, 2021. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, YouTuber Garrett from Man Made Mead talks about some of his experiments busting or confirming some mead myths. Can raisins be used as nutrients? What happens if you don't mix your honey and water at all? Stay tuned to find out. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. I sent out a bonus video this past week to financial supporters. I, I showed how I ferment a, a sort of kimchi using Brussels sprouts in a vacuum-sealed bag. It's, it's fun and, and easy to do. No worrying about uh, keeping the uh, veggies under a brine in a jar. You just, you just have to keep an eye out to make sure the bag doesn't pop <laughs> after a few days. Um, I also, at the end of the video, uh, cook a recipe uh, for stir-fry shrimp using the veggies from the uh, fermented uh, process. It was actually really good. Uh, Steve and I have scheduled time this week to shoot some video episodes. I know we've been way behind on that, uh, but we're going to try to make up for it this week. I have a, a dry-hopped mead and a, a coconut black beer using uh, a toasted coconut and uh, midnight wheat uh, based on the uh, malt sampler that uh, Steve and I did with those dark beers. Steve has a couple of delicious beers, too, one with tart cherries that uh, tastes a lot like a cherry pie. And uh, I don't know how many shows we can practically do in a day, uh, but I guess we'll see. <laughs> uh, oh, and I've also uh, shot another bonus video for financial supporters on how to make smoked jalapeno powder, and that is uh, for a future uh, release. Let's take a look into the mailbag. I got a couple of interesting notes after the Amarillo Holler Tower uh, hop sampler. Uh, Jay writes in and says, One of your comments towards the very end of the episode threw me for a loop. You say in the show that the blend of all three beers was the tastiest of them, but it seems to me that blending beers one and two at a one-to-one -one ratio should taste very similar, if not identical, to beer number three. At least it makes sense to me. If you gentlemen... Uh, I'm sure he uses that term loosely. If you gentlemen would uh, do us a favor uh, for us listeners and for science, would you mind doing an experiment for the next hop sampler? Please try mixing the two different smash beers one-to-one -to, -one to see how that compares to the one that you brewed with mixed hops. I like that. I like that suggestion, Jay. I appreciate that. Uh, I have to note that at the end of, the, of sampling the sampler, uh, the levels uh, in all three cups... Um, at least on my side of the conversation, will not were not equal, so it wasn't um, a one to one to one ratio being mixed together, and unfortunately, I don't remember what that ratio was. So, uh, I do like your idea of blending uh, the two uh, single hop beers equally uh, at the end of the show uh, to see if the resulting beer is the same as the beer brewed with uh, with both hops. So, uh, if I can remember. Uh, at the end of the next uh, hop sampler, uh, we should try that. For the sake of science, of course. Thanks, Jay. David from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, writes in with this. David says, I recently listened to the Amarillo Holler Tower hop sampler episode where you were shocked to find out that your predictions weren't as easy as you thought they would be. It just so happened that very night I was reading For the Love of Hops and came across this paragraph. 
Cascade has been, this is the quoting the paragraph, Cascade has been particularly attractive for breeders. Lutz also used it for multiple crosses in Germany. Toru Kishimoto's studies in Japan indicate that it is rich in a black currant-like aroma that characterizes American hops, although without as much 4-MMP as varieties such as Simcoe. Surprisingly, when brewers evaluated the hop, this is talking about Cascade, before it was released in 1972, they compared it to Holler Tower Middlefru. So David says that's Cascade, but considering its similarity to Amarillo, maybe you shouldn't be so hard on yourselves. Well, there you go. Thanks, David. I, I appreciate that. Very interesting. Let's read a note from uh, Rob in Seattle that is in praise of our friends and sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. Rob wrote me a while back uh, asking for my advice on electric brewing systems, and I, of course, told Rob about my Warthog Electric Brew in a Bag system from HighGravityBrew.com. Well, Rob updated me saying that he did, in fact, buy a Warthog system from Desiree and Dave. Rob says, I didn't end up getting the Brew in a Bag configuration. I moved locations, so I had a little bit more room in the garage to purchase the two-vessel system with the EBC-130 controller, and I love it. I brewed my first batch with the new system yesterday and absolutely love it. I can't believe I waited so long to purchase, but glad I took your advice. Rob went on to uh, praise the customer service that he got from Dave. So that's awesome. I'm glad uh, d uh, Rob decided to go with a Warthog system from HighGravityBrew.com, and I'm happy that he's so pleased with it, of course. Why don't you head on over to uh, HighGravityBrew.com and check out what they have that can take the uh, pain out of propane for you, from five gallons to two barrels, and whether it's a single-vessel system like mine, a two-vessel system like Rob's, or if you want to go to three vessels, HighGravityBrew.com has the setup that you'll love. That's at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. That's HighGravityBrew.com. Okay, Ricky the Mead Maker from Gruenfell Meadery told me about Garrett's YouTube channel and uh, actually introduced us uh, through email. Uh, Garrett's doing a lot of fun experiments with small batches of mead. Garrett from Man Made Mead, which is a tongue twister. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Hello. Thanks for having me. I uh, have to credit uh, Ricky the Mead Maker uh for introducing us uh he you know he's he's the uh, the mead guy and has been on youtube for a while uh and he just out of the blue a couple weeks ago said hey have you met garrett over at mad M I, i'm i'm having trouble saying the name <laughs> of your channel man made mead uh, and uh, he said that you're doing a whole lot of fun experiments over there and and uh, wanted us to get together so so credit kudos goes to uh, ricky Absolutely. Ricky, uh, he, he, we had talked about it, but he kind of got me into mead making in a lot of ways. So I have a lot of credit to give to him for sure. So how did you get into uh, mead making and, and uh, how long have you been doing it? So this is, uh, I started brewing probably four and a half years ago, five years ago, roughly. I started mead making about three and a half years ago. Um, I got into it because I wanted to start home brewing. I originally decided to uh, try beer making, and then I saw the grandmaster list of things to buy, and I was like, oh, I don't want to have to buy all that stuff. <laughs> um, and so I ended up deciding, oh, meat is just you know a, a glass carboy and honey and water and yeast. And so I, I bought it for the ease, or started it for the ease, and then um, kind of quickly fell further into it. But I decided to start my YouTube channel uh, the same time I started really homebrewing mead because I wanted to document my process for good or bad and uh, just kind of put it out there for people to see. So that's what I did about three and a half years ago was start my first few videos and uh, it was a lot of fun to to do that. I take it that you it didn't take you long to find out that there's a lot of things that people say that you got to do or that you you be sure you don't do this because you know you're going to mess up your meat or or if you if you uh if you don't follow these rules you know exactly you're going to screw up you know there's a whole lot of uh uh do's and don'ts out there that 
Uh, when you first start out, it's very intimidating because you don't want to go outside the lines. Uh, when did you start getting kind of curious about, you know, whether all these things were, uh, you know, hard and fast rules that you should follow or, or whether they're uh, myths? So um, I, I feel like for a long time I followed the rules that I read online and um, I didn't question them because I was just trying to make something that was I thought was good and I, I didn't really doubt. It wasn't until I got to probably 30 or 40 meads in till I started to kind of ask the question, well, why, you know, what's the purpose of um, adding this specific nutrient over another? And I started to to investigate more. And I really just wanted to make more um, consistent meads. And I wanted to have a, a better fermentation process. And as I started to dive deeper into the the uh, analytical side of, of using specific nutrients and things, I found that there, there are a lot of myths that people have created uh, underneath these rules or facts that um, – we often see with mead making. And I think that's just because mead making is a very old tradition and it's it's rooted in such a way that you're not really supposed to break the rules. It's pretty taboo. Mm -hmm. So I, I got a little nervous um, to break them at first, but I decided that for the sake of my channel uh, and the, the idea that I could do something more than just you know, stir up honey, water, and yeast and <laughs> ingredients and just, you know, make different recipes, I could actually do some some fun things to uh, expand some knowledge. Um, that's, I started to go further with that investigation. Yeah, the the process of making meat is, is you know, deceptive in that, you know, it, it looks simple, and it is simple, but there are some things that, that you're better off doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yes. <laughs> So uh, one thing that you do is you use small batches for your experiments, which I find is extremely helpful. Number one, you d you're not investing a whole lot of money. Uh, and then mm -hmm. number two, uh, you get to uh, split up these batches and, and, you know, have different results with uh, not a whole lot of equipment. You know, there's so many um, advantages to doing small batches. Absolutely. And I, and I think even more so... Uh, I know people do micro beers and things, but mead being as expensive as it, as it is, like you said, it's nice to, you know, test out the honey you want to use or the recipe you want to go for. And um, I find myself doing that for probably about 50% of my meads. I will do a test batch, a small, small half gallon test batch first and then invest in the larger batch once I'm once I'm confident. Hmm. Also, being a home brewer, I, I love to give my stuff away, but with creating so much mead, uh, there comes a point where I have too much and I run out <laughs> of bottles. So using small batches can kind of save me some space, too, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, one thing about doing a lot of experiments is you got a lot of stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah, so much. <laughs> Now let's let's go through some of the of, of your experiments uh, that's on your channel. And again, that, that's man-made mead. I feel like I'm back in uh, drama class, uh, <laughs> you know, trying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me, 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 you know, trying. We, we're doing our our labials uh, today with the man-made <laughs> mead. Uh, let's talk about yeast rehydration, and that's one that I think that we've covered on this show, but it's been so long ago that I can't remember the specifics. Uh, but it would seem like a lot of these things, especially, uh, you know, when dealing with yeast, it seems like beer is a little more forgiving than mead. Mm -hmm. uh, so the differences may, you know, shine out uh, or, or show themselves uh, better with mead than, than with beer. So how did you design your experiment around yeast rehydration? And what's the question that you were trying to answer? base question I, I saw and I wanted to test was, does, does rehydration um, positively impact your yeast in fermentation? Really just seeing if they fermented um, in a more healthy fashion. So I designed my test by doing two different meads that were the same recipe, same amount of honey, all those things, and simply leaving one as is, um, well, I should say the two meads taking my two different yeast I had, um, rehydrating one only in water, 
and I'll talk about my shortcomings here in a second of this test, but rehydrating only in water that was room temp, first shortcoming. And then the other one, I sprinkled the yeast on top of the mead. And then I let them ferment and kind of documented a process through a time lapse, came back and did a short tasting. And um, my results of that specific test were that the rehydrated yeast kicked off faster. They started fermenting roughly maybe two to three hours earlier, um, fully fermenting earlier than the uh, sprinkled version. And I can only attribute that to the yeast waking up and uh, just having more opportunity to see what they're going to do. In the video, I, I said something along the lines of it's the difference between, um, you know, waking up and someone shoving your breakfast in your mouth and <laughs> then, you know, waking up, having a few minutes and then eating your breakfast. So <laughs> in that case, you know, the yeast that rehydrated had some time to wake up and then ate their breakfast. And I think that allowed them to be a little more um, competent and moving in the beginning. And and I think that the, that there's research that that says that uh, you know absorbing water into the cells is you know physiologically easier on the yeast cells than you know absorbing a thick sugar solution. Uh, you yes. know, so that so there's it should be more stressful uh, or less stressful for to to just absorb water uh, and get hydrated rather than you know a a sugary solution. Absolutely. And um, the end result, you know, my the yeast that was sprinkled actually ended up settling at around 1.03 gravity. It didn't really finish. And the one that rehydrated finished at about 1.010. So mm. I think that rehydration actually did push the yeast further along. And um, I, I do believe that the the sprinkled yeast probably just had a little more trouble, like you said, acclimating to the must. Did you find it other than the sweetness? Uh, I assume that the uh, that the sprinkled one was more sweet than the uh, the hydrated one. Other than absolutely, uh, other than the the perceived sweetness, were there any other uh, off flavors that you detected? Not that I noticed. Now I do want to say that this is part one of my shortcoming of this. I wish I had you know, maybe given it more time or done something to more comfortably give the yeast a more comfortable environment to ferment. Uh, cause I don't know if that was my issue, but the, the, the fact that there was sweetness could have possibly jaded my tasting test just a little bit. And mm -hmm. in fact, I've, I've already decided I'm going to redo this test again. And when I redo it, I am going to, uh, actually provide each with nutrients. Cause I, I did realize not giving them nutrients caused the issue of uh, not a full fermentation. Mm -hmm. There was just stressed yeast within that. Now, there was no fusel. There was no odd off flavor that was significant. I don't think there's a huge difference. But the fact that it was sweeter, again, could have made it a little harder to tell. Yeah. I mean, even if, uh, if you know, both, since you were doing both the same uh, as far as nutrient level, they were both starting off on the same playing field. So, mm -hmm. you know, you might have gotten more complete fermentation in each of them. Uh, you know, who knows? You you know, the next time you do it, if you do give uh, yeast nutrients, it could be that the the sprinkled one could catch up, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing well, about doing ex kinda... experiments is you get to do them again. You get to change a variable and, and see the effect. Absolutely. And I think within that rehydration process, um, I... I should have rehydrated them at, you know, the 100 degrees Fahrenheit where they're more comfortable, where they're supposed to be rehydrated and given them some maybe go firm or some sort of nutrient initially. Now, that's a whole nother test because then you have to take the other variable, you know, that's multiple variables, variables. But uh, I do think the fact that I didn't rehydrate them at the proper temperature could have also affected that. Hence why I'm going to redo it in the future. Well, there you go. Uh, did, uh, so did you do anything after that to, uh, make the fermentation more complete after you, after your fermentation or your experiment was uh, completed? Uh, did you then do things to, uh, dry those meads out more? 
No, I actually ended up combining them into the same bucket and using them for the the base meat of um, some other things I was doing, adding some flavors to them. So uh, I honestly cannot recall because I, when I put them in that bucket, I, my brain kind of shut them off and said, "All right, they're done," <laughs> and I didn't I didn't make them their own entity at that point. So I wish I had left them alone because there could have been some more fermentation um, by themselves, but unfortunately, I didn't. Now, this next experiment is is one that uh, the debate has been going on in the homebrew community for a long time, and that mm-hmm. is it, that is bucket versus carboy. You know, does the shape uh, or or material of a of a fermenter does it actually make a difference uh, in the uh, the fermentation process? So, how did you approach this experiment of, of bucket versus carboy? I feel like the idea of it was pretty simple. I Mixed together two gallons of must, um, and then I put one gallon into a three and a half gallon bucket, and then one gallon into a glass carboy, and then pitched my yeast, did all that, let them ferment through their whole process, and came back and did a taste test. And my, like you just said, my whole purpose was to find out if there is any difference between the two fermentations. Um, I noted that there was no actual taste difference between them as far as actual um, gravity readings and quickness of fermentation. I I can't say that I did a great job of uh, (laughs) marking those down, you know, and and saying every, every few days I should have done that. So I couldn't tell you if one fermented quicker than the other, but, Um, but I take it they finished the same or finished in a similar fashion. Yes. They both finished dry. Um, I can't remember. They're at least 1.000. And I left them that way for the taste test, of course, and then tasted them. And I found no difference um, between the two at that time. And I think this is the one. Is this the one where you where you did a, a blind tasting uh, and labeled them on the screen where we could we could tell what you were tasting and the and uh, and you couldn't. I believe so. Um I'd have to honestly, I've done so many videos now, my brain, I'm, I'm having to recall back to what exactly happened in that. That's terrible. Of me. <laughs> no, I can I definitely identify. <laughs> so, so, I, uh, some, so, you know, I've been doing this. Is, this is our 16th year, I think. And, and somebody will ask me, you know, why don't you do an episode on this subject? And I'll search the archives and I'll say, oh, oh, I did that <laughs> 11 <yeah>, years <exactly>. ago. <laughs> uh, I, I don't recall. And in fact, I'm trying to look up now. I know I've done that with like a blueberry mead a trio that I did and had some different flavorings and did a blind taste test where I couldn't actually see what I was tasting. But I don't recall off the top of my head with that one. Yeah, it's I mean, a lot of it, it does come down to sensory perception. Um, I, I used to have a or a friend of mine in high school uh, used to be an audiophile, and he would buy, you know, the most expensive turntables that he could afford and the most expensive tuners and speakers. Uh, and I would s- come listen to his new gear, and I would say, well, that sounds like the old gear. You know, it sounds just like the old. Right. I can't tell the difference. But he would then show me the specs, you know, show me the uh, frequency response and things like that. And on paper, you know, this this speaker is a much better than the uh, one I got rid of. So, uh, you know, when it all comes down to it, uh if it if it tastes good and it ju- and it tastes as good as the other that you've done, maybe that's okay. <laughs> maybe that's yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, and, and uh, to answer your question, I just I just found it. I did do a blind tasting. I had four glasses. I did label the bottom, and then I switched them around to where I couldn't know what they were and tasted them and tried to identify and couldn't really honestly identify super well. So, um, so there the, you go. <laughs> yeah. So my my. In my in thoughts with that one, where fermenting in a bucket ha, uh, has a or is easier because you are able to rack easier, in my opinion, for one. But two, you're also able to make sure there's enough fermentation space. In that case, you know, I was fermenting in a one gallon carboy, almost up to the to the top of the neck. If there was a vigorous fermentation, there was a, there would have been a high likelihood that the uh, mead would explode in some way or have some issues whereas a bucket you don't really have those issues in general and during that fermentation you have that 
blanket layer of uh, CO2, if I'm not mistaken, that kind of protects from oxygenation. Um, and that, so that worry of, is this going to be oxidized? Isn't really a thing. Yeah. Especially if you, if you leave it uh, with the lid on and, uh, you know, an airlock engaged and you don't disturb it, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, there's, there's going to be CO2 on top of that. So it doesn't matter what the surface area is, as long as there's that blanket of CO2 and there's no oxygen Absolutely. in there, air in there to mix in. So and I noticed uh, if you're going to use like fruit of some sort, I have done the game where you try and shove apples and pears down a carboy <laughs> and it's one, it takes up space. You, you know, you lose in your one gallon of mead, you lose probably a third of a gallon because your fruit takes up space. So the bucket just uh, removes that issue. Oh, there you go. So, so it may be, you know, I, in beer, I like to see what's going on, so I use uh, glass carboys a lot. Um, but you know, when I when I use a bucket, I get good beer too. So uh, people people used to say, you know, you don't buckets of plastic's bad because you can scratch it, and that's where you know germs can or bugs can live, and you know bacteria, and that can spoil your uh, beer in the future. Uh, you know, I I don't I don't. To use a lot of uh, Brillo pads on my bucket, so uh, you know, I don't, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, so it just may be a, a matter of uh, personal preference. And, uh, buckets, and I do. buckets are lighter. I keep interrupting you, but buckets are lighter, no, you're fine. <laughs> and they don't uh, shatter when you when you drop them. Oh, absolutely. And so you know, there's there's a lot a lot to be said for a bucket. Now, there is the other side of the, the argument that, like, if you were to age in a bucket, you know, then there's issues. Of course, there's that space we talked about. Even you can layer some CO2 on top and, and save from oxidation. But the aging on plastic is, I think, where the big issue comes. And so, you know, I'd recommend to people, if they can, ferment in a bucket and then move to a glass carboy for any aging stage. Well, there you go. Let's take a quick break from talking about mead to talk about mead. Ricky and Kelly from Groenfell Meadery uh, up in Vermont have a new limited edition mead that they're shipping across the country. Oak Aged Valkyrie's Choice. It's available for pre-sale right now. Ricky says Oak Aged Valkyrie's Choice is beautiful in both its simplicity and its complexity. It's nothing more than honey, water, and Groenfell's house strain of yeast, but... Adding carved oak staves creates something new and delicious. And at only 6.9% ABV, it's relatively sessionable, at least in the world of meads. Head on over to growandfowl.com to reserve yours now. Ricky says it, it should ship by the end of the month. Uh, Oak-aged Valkyrie's Choice from family-owned and operated growandfowl.com. That's G R O E N N. F E L L. This one was uh, was one that I was fascinated, really fascinated by, because it's so visual, and that was uh, the the uh, experiment you did where you mixed the honey in one and mm -hmm. you didn't mix the honey in the other. Uh, and I've talked to people who uh, talked about their fermentation, or you know, talk about. Uh, making sure to mix the mead or mi mix the must really well when you get started, uh, you know, because you want to get that honey all, uh, you know, uh, mixed in there well with the water and make sure everything is evenly distributed so that you, you know, get a really good fermentation. This is an experiment that you really push the boundaries there because in one you mixed it real well and the other you didn't. So how do mm -hmm. you talk about the structure of that one? Yeah. So I had saw or someone sent a, comment or email or something saying what would happen if you did this and i immediately jumped on the wagon and said let's do it i basically just took two half gallon carboys uh, or mason jars basically and like you said i i mixed in the i believe it was about a pound and a half or less honey into the one and made sure it was super well mixed and the other one i poured the honey i filled it with some water as much as I could, and then I put the same amount of honey on top. I didn't try to disturb the honey or mix it in any way, and then just pitch the yeast on top of both. And what I noticed through my time-lapse thing that I did and some other various just 
you know, watching it. Um, the, I think the yeast actually woke up and in the non mixed honey, at least woke up and I, I can't quite explain how they started to, in a way, self mix the honey <laughs> and water. But I think that there must have been the slightest amount of sugar content. Maybe with them resting on the bottom, they were able to, you know, uh, accumulate some of that sugar content and start fermenting. And then through the process of fermentation, which is generally somewhat vigorous and somewhat mixing, that honey just started to, uh, you know, mix itself. Um, it was a really fascinating thing, like you said. And just watching the honey level go down over the course of a week to two weeks was uh, pretty wild. I didn't expect it. Yeah, you'd look at the jar and there's this there's water and then there's this this, you know, it's like a black and tan. There's this line <laughs> where, it's, mm -hmm. where it's just like this heavy honey just sitting on the bottom of this uh, of the jar uh, and the. the I don't I don't know if there was some sort of I don't know what the process is is it osmosis is it what is it you know the where the the water you know just interacted with the honey and uh, but but the yeast had to have something to do with it especially after the fermentation started uh because you know like you said there is a there is a vigorousness to fermentation that actually moves the fluid around but doggone it you know by the by the end of it it you couldn't see that layer of honey anymore so, so what was the? I assume that the mixed fermentation went a lot faster. Number one. Oh, absolutely. It was done. The mixed was done probably four to five days before, at least, and it kicked off. You know, there was no problem with it at all. It just, it just did its normal thing. Um, and in the end, the the results of like tasting the two, I don't did not notice a significant difference between the two. And I also found that to be interesting. I do think to the yeast, I'm trying to think of a visual to explain it, but the yeast were able to like grab both sides of the, of the fence and get some <laughs> honey and get some water on the other side and, and bring it in. And, and that's what maybe caused them to allow that fermentation to begin. Um, so, yeah. So so what did the num what did the numbers say? What was your uh, finishing gravity? Was it the same in both batches? Um oh man, I will have to pull that up. I <laughs> don't have that pulled up on on right now. I will do that right now as we're talking. If I can find it. I apologize. <laughs> I'm trying to remember myself. I'm going to say yes cuz I think that that would have stood out in my mind if uh, if there was a significant difference. I I believe they were the same. Um the, I don't I do not recall there being a vast difference, if any, between the two. So, I, you know, I guess one finding is that it's good to mix the honey, <laughs> but mm -hmm. just yes. for expediency's sake, you know, you'll get a faster fermentation and probably a more reliable fermentation. Uh, but if you don't, if you don't mix your honey just 100 percent perfectly well, when you pitch your yeast, don't worry about it. That's that's what I took. You know, you took yeah. the ex one, one one thing we can do with these experiments is we can take the extreme. You know, what if I just really screwed this up? Will it still uh -huh. make good beer? Will it still make good mead? Uh, and you you really took the extreme of not mixing them at all, and you still got good mead. I would absolutely I would still recommend people to mix as well as you can, simply because you want to have the most accurate gravity reading possible ah. and i think that's where the discrepancy would be is that yes theoretically you could do what i did but you would have to have the exact same mead on the other side going as well with the exact same honey and and, and all that stuff because you wouldn't really know truly what your gravity is if let's say you tried to mix in three pounds and a quarter of a pound was left at the bottom that might affect your yeast or excuse me your your gravity in a significant manner that's a good point that's a good point yeah you, know, you do to take a good uh, gra original gravity reading uh you do want to mix it up uh, really well uh which is why people uh a lot of people i'm sorry to cut you off a lot of people will actually wait 24 hours before they do a gravity reading is so that if there's any honey it mixed in there that's that wasn't truly mixed it is hopefully by that point dissolved Huh. Interesting. So, so they wait uh, twenty four hours before they pitch the yeast at that point. 
No, you could uh, you could pitch the yeast. I would say that most yeast, unless it's a crazy insane one, probably don't kick in till sixteen to you know twenty four hours. And at that point, uh, I mean, yes, there is a little bit of chewing of the gravity, but I would not say it's a significant amount. Um, and some yeast even take longer. I've seen, I've had problems, or not problems. I've had yeast that take up to thirty six to forty eight hours to really do anything. So. Not everybody will do that. In fact, I very rarely have waited 24 hours to take a gravity reading, but mm. I use a drill and I just go to town and mix it as you know vigorously as I can to get some oxygen in. So I never really worry about truly mixing it in well. Right. Yeah. You need to need to get uh, oxygen in there one way or the other. Uh-huh. Uh huh. We talked about nutrients. We mentioned nutrients. Uh, this this final experiment that we, we're going to talk about. Um, is using raisins as a nutrient. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if I've heard this before, but is, is this is this a thing that people use, throw some, some raisins in there as a yeast nutrient? Yes. Yeah, so if you look at most old mead recipes, there is a, they never mention anything about nutrients specifically, but what we're deducing over time is that old brewing methods saw raisins as a, mouthfeel changer and, and building a little bit of body and then also a nutrient source. And um, that's just because the, the own sugars and, and the makeup of that raisin do have, theoretically, nutrients to help a mead or yeast ferment. Mm -hmm. So I, I have seen this a long time. And in fact, when I first started brewing, I threw raisins in my stuff because that's what you did. That was the, <laughs> the standard. And like I said, I didn't, I didn't question it. And um, it was only over time as I saw other, exper uh, other people questioning it, I should say, that I really wanted to do something about it. So what I, I did for that specific experiment was I took – I made nine gallons of mead in total. I wanted to um, – push the the limits of this test i did three gal or yeah three gallons of mead with one specific yeast three with another three with another in one of each group i left it alone i didn't add any nutrient source at all so it was honey water and yeast in another i added a handful of raisins as the nutrient source and then in the third one i put dimonium phosphate which mm. is you know a pretty standard nutrient source that you can buy that's cheap right i i did that with the um with the other two yeast so the ones i used were the lalvin k1v1116 lalvin d47 and the mangrove jacks mo5 those three yeasts okay calculated the the gravities over the course of their fermentation every two days i would just go through and take a gravity reading and and write it down what I noticed was that the in um, in the yeast the true I well I don't want to say true in the case of the dimonium phosphate yeast nutrient the yeast accepted that one quicker and fermented through their fermentation much faster. Hmm. So I saw and I'm looking at my notes here. I saw in in each one. Um, they all finished in about, you know, six to 10 days with that dimonium phosphate. The raisins took a little while longer. The raisins at least each at least took 20 to 26 days, depending on the yeast. And the nothing version that I didn't add anything in took about same thing, 24 to 26, 28 days. Hmm. My end result was that, or in resolve, was that the, the raisins added a small amount of nutrient, um, but they didn't truly add enough to, uh, for me to conclude them as a nutrient source. They didn't really move as fast as I would want to be considered that. And was there an impact on the final gravities uh, between the batches? Um, no, they all ended up at 1.000. They all leveled out. Wow. Huh. So, yeah, it was just the speed at which they changed. And the, there's, of course, a video on this if you want to watch it on my channel. But the, the breakdowns, of course, they all they change. And one moves a little faster. And then the other one catches up. And there's a whole 
you know, whole thing there. But they all ended at the same gravity. We did a taste test, and um, they tasted somewhat similar. I do think that the raisins added flavor, so it's hard to, to justify and say that it was totally even. But it, it was a very fun test. It took me like two to three months to finish, but it was a, it was a lot of fun. Well, that's interesting. I've, that surprises me that the that the uh, mead without any nutrients at all did so well. Um, you know, I've I've had meads that uh, that stalled out. You know, that that uh, that had some problems in fermenting. Uh, you know, and and I attributed that to the lack of of nutrients. So it it uh, you know it's a, it's a, it surprises me that number one uh, that they ever, ever all the batches got finished. And that number mm-hmm. two, you didn't uh, taste any uh, evidence of struggling yeast uh, in the ones that that weren't, um, you know, uh, that weren't fed properly. Yeah, and, and I was the same way. I, I thought surely there's going to be a, a difference between the two. I, I have heard, in hindsight, I have heard that people that uh, dimonium phosphate as a nutrient can sometimes add a little bit of that. Um, some people call it the rocket fuel idea, and mm. I think that's just because that quick fermentation can lead to sometimes yeast having their own response. But I didn't notice that in that case. The other thing I, I saw uh, within my comments was people saying, you should have cut the raisins in half to <laughs> allow the yeast to truly get in there. You know, there's that skin barrier of the raisin and yada, yada. Huh. So I'm actually working on that test now. That's my next one. It'll be out in probably a month or so. But it, uh, I did the same thing or a similar thing. I chopped up raisins in one, and then I just put a regular handful of raisins in another. And I've tracked the um, the uh, gravity readings as it's gone along. So I won't spoil that test, but it's not looking good. <laughs> now, the, the, did you? How much yeast did you pitch in each of these small batches? Um, I believe at that time I did at least two grams per okay. per one. Okay, and that so, was so it wasn't like a whole pack. <laughs> no, no. Um, I, actually, I'm finding it right now. I did one and a half. It was a one and a half grams per uh, per mead. Okay, well that that blows my theory because my my theory was that you know if you'd p- pitched like you know a whole package of of mead in a one gallon batch, well the you know the yeast had enough. Uh, cells there to do the job without having to reproduce, and therefore, you know, it was okay. And but the, yeah, never mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm and I'd actually I'd done the test one time before that. I even did a whole video about it um, and finished the video. I did the exact same thing: raisins in one, nothing in another, nutrient in the other one. When I did the nutrient, I also added an energizer and. Um, I did dimonium phosphate and then uh, some sort of energizer. I can't remember now. And let that ferment. It was the same results, essentially. Hmm. But I, I threw the test out because I went, oh, crap, I used actual energizer. Maybe that was an unfair advantage for that specific me. So I just threw that test out and redid it all with the three other yeasts. Hmm. Well, it's fascinating, and we're just we're just scratching the surface on the content on man-made mead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> trying to enunciate, <laughs> I swear I haven't been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> just, just my lazy lips. Uh, but uh, the, but we're just scratching the surface because you do a whole lot of stuff. It's not just experiments. Uh, you know, you you do a whole, you experiment with the, with different ingredients, or or you make meads with different ingredients. You do, you have a series on uh, you know the basics of making mead. Uh, there's just a, a whole lot of stuff out there, uh, and I compliment you on um, on your your stick to itiveness and and your thoroughness and and getting good information out there. Well, thank you. The science behind it has become much more fascinating than I thought. When I first started, I was mixing stuff, and now I'm. I, I'm just so interested in every single test. And so the Mead Mythbusters series is probably my favorite at this point. Well, there you go. Well, we look forward to uh, to more stuff. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe when you when you get more experiments under your belt, uh, maybe we can talk again. Absolutely. I'd love that. All right. Thanks, Garrett. I appreciate it. 
Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate you. Thanks again to Garrett. Lots of good mead-making material over in the Man Made Mead channel. Marvelous. <laughs> I love alliteration. <laughs> if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our, our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dots. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long. So long.